Captain Cuttle fell asleep thirteen stanzas into the nineteenth song, and Schmendrick, who had stopped laughing somewhat sooner, promptly set about trying to free himself. He strained against his bonds with all his strength, but they held fast. Jack Jingly had wrapped him in enough rope to rig a small schooner, and tied knots the size of skulls. "Gently, gently," he counselled himself. "No man with the power to summon Robin Hood, indeed to create him, can be bound for long. A word, a wish, and this tree must be an acorn on a branch again, this rope be green in a marsh." But he knew before he called on it that whatever had visited him for a moment was gone again, leaving only an ache where it had been. He felt like an abandoned chrysalis. "'Do as you will,' he said softly. Captain Cully roused at his voice and sang the fourteenth stanza. "'There are fifty swords without the house and fifty more within, and I do fear me, Captain, they are like to do us in.' Hey done, hey done, says Captain Cully, and never fear again, for they may be a hundred swords, but we are seven men. I hope you get slaughtered, the magician told him, but Cully was asleep again. Schmendrick attempted a few simple spells for escaping, but he could not use his hands, and he had no more heart for tricks. What happened instead was that the tree fell in love with him, and began to murmur fondly of the joy to be found in the internal embrace of a red oak. Always, always, it sighed, faithfulness beyond any man's deserving. I will keep the color of your eyes when no other in the world remembers your name. There is no immortality but a tree's love. I'm engaged, Schmendrick excused himself, to a western lark since childhood. Marriage by contract, no choice in the matter. Hopeless. Our story is never to be. A gust of fury shook the oak, as though a storm were coming to it alone. Galls and fire blight on her, it whispered savagely. Damned softwood, cursed conifer, deceitful evergreen, she'll never have you. We will perish together, and all trees shall treasure our tragedy. Along his length, Schmendrick could feel the tree heaving like a heart, and he feared that it might actually split in two with rage. The ropes were growing steadily tighter around him, and the night was beginning to turn re red and yellow. He tried to explain to the oak that love was generously, precisely because it could never be immortal, and then he tried to yell for Captain Cully, but he could only make a small creaking sound, like a tree. She means well he thought, and gave himself up for loved. Then the ropes went slack as he lunged against them, and he fell to the ground on his back, wriggling for air. The unicorn stood over him, dark as blood in his darkened vision. She touched him with her horn. When he could rise, she turned away, and the magician followed her, wary of the oak, though it was once again as still as any tree that had never loved. The sky was still black, but it was a watery darkness through which Schmendrick could see the violet dawn swimming. Hard silver clouds were melting as the sky grew warm. Shadows dulled, sounds lost their shape, and shapes had not yet decided what they were going to be that day. Even the wind wondered about itself. "'Did you see me?' he asked the unicorn. "'Were you watching? Did you see what I made?' "'Yes,' she answered. "'It was true magic.' The loss came back, cold and bitter as a sword. "'It's gone now,' he said. "'I had it. It had me. But it's gone now. I couldn't hold it.' The unicorn floated on before him, silent as a feather. Close by, a familiar voice said, "'Leaving us so early, magician? The men will be sorry they missed you.' He turned and saw Molly Grew leaning against a tree. Dress and dirty hair tattered alike, bare feet bleeding and beslimed, she gave him a bat's grin. Surprise, she said, it's Maid Marian. Then she saw the unicorn. She neither moved nor spoke, but her tawny eyes were suddenly big with tears. For a long moment she did not move. Then, 
each fist seized a handful of her hem, and she warped her knees into a kind of trembling crouch. Her ankles were crossed and her eyes were lowered, but for all that it took Shpendrick another moment to realize that uh, Molly Grew was curtseying. He burst out laughing, and Molly sprang up, red from hairline to throat hollow. "'Where have you been?' she cried. "'Damn you, where have you been?' She took a few steps towards Smendrick, but she was looking beyond him at the unicorn. When she tried to get by, the magician stood in her way. "'You don't talk like that,' he told her, still uncertain that Molly had recognized the unicorn. "'Don't you know how to behave, woman? You don't curtsy either.' But Molly pushed him aside and went up to the unicorn, scolding her as though she were a strayed milk cow. "'Where have you been?' Before the whiteness of the shining horn, Molly shrank to a shrilling beetle. But this time it was the unicorn's old dark eyes that looked down. "'I am here now,' she said at last. Molly laughed with her lips flat. "'And what good is that to me now that you're here now? Where were you twenty years ago? Ten years ago? How dare you?' How dare you come to me now when I am this? With a flap of her hand, she summed herself up, barren face, desert eyes, and yellowing heart. I wish you'd never come. Why did you come now? The tears began to slide down the sides of her nose. The unicorn made no reply, and Schmendrick said, She is the last. She is the last unicorn in the world. She would be, Molly sniffed. It would be the last unicorn in the world that came to Molly Grew. She reached up then to lay her hand on the unicorn's cheek, but both of them flinched a little, and the touch came to rest on the swift, shivering place under the jaw. Molly said, It's all right. I forgive you. Unicorns are not to be forgiven. The magician felt himself growing giddy with jealousy, not only of the touch, but of something like a secret that was moving between Molly and the unicorn. Unicorns are for beginnings, he said, for innocence and purity, for newness. Unicorns are for young girls. Molly was stroking the unicorn's throat as timidly as though she were blind. She dried her grimy tears on the white mane. You don't know much about unicorns, she said. The sky was jade gray now, and the trees that had been drawn on the dark a moment ago were real trees again, hissing in the dawn wind. Schmendrick said coldly, looking at the unicorn, We must go. Molly agreed promptly. Aye, before the men stumble on us and slit your throat for cheating them, the poor lads, she looked over her shoulder. I had some things I wanted to take, but they don't matter now. I'm ready. Schmendrick barred her way again as he stepped forward. You can't come with us. We're on a quest. His eyes and voice were as stern as he could make them, but he could feel his nose being bewildered. He had never been able to discipline his nose. Molly's own face closed like a castle against him, trundling out the guns and slings and cauldrons of boiling lead. And who are you to say we? I'm her guide, the magician said importantly. The unicorn made a soft, wondering sound, like a cat calling her kittens. Molly laughed aloud, and it made and made it back. "'You don't know much about unicorns,' she repeated. "'She's letting you travel with her, though I can't think of why. "'But she has no need of you. "'She doesn't need me either, heaven knows, but she'll take me too. "'Ask her.' "'The unicorn made the soft sound again, "'and the castle of Molly's face lowered the drawbridge "'and threw wide even its deepest keep. "'Ask her,' she said. Schmendrick knew the unicorn's answer by the sinking in his heart. He meant to be wise, but then his envy and emptiness hurt him, and he heard himself cry out sadly, Never! I forbid it! I, Schmendrick the magician! His voice darkened, and even his nose grew menacing. Be wary of rousing a wizard's wrath! Rousing! If I chose to, I could turn you into a frog! I should laugh myself sick, said Molly pleasantly. You're handy with fairy tales, but you couldn't turn cream into butter. Her eyes gleamed with a sudden mean understanding. Have sense, man, she said. What were you going to do with the last unicorn in the world? 
keep her in a cage? The magician turned away to keep Molly from seeing his face. He did not look directly at the unicorn, but stole small sights of her as stealthily as though he could be made to put them back. White and secret, mourning horned, she regarded him with piercing gentleness, but he could not touch her. He said to the thin woman, "'You don't even know where we're bound.' "'Do you think it matters to me?' Molly asked. She made the cat sound once more. Schmendrick said, "'We are journeying to King Haggard's country to find the Red Bull.' Molly's skin was frightened for a moment, whatever her bones believed or her heart knew. But then the unicorn breathed softly into her cupped hand, and Molly smiled as she closed her fingers on the warmth. "'Well, you're going the wrong way,' she said.'